I'm delighted to introduce Hamad Nasser, a curator, writer and researcher. Hamad served as head of research and programs at Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong from 2012 to 2016. And he will be curating the UAE's National Pavilion at the 57th Venice Art Biennale this year. Earlier, Nasser co-founded uh, the non-profit arts organization Green Cardamom and curated numerous exhibitions. Hamad serves on the editorial board of Tate, etc., is a jury member for the v a Museum's Jamil Prize, and we're really pleased that he can join us here today to open this vital theme. Hamad. Uh, for me, exhibitions are ways to think in public, with artists and through art. The things that I want to think about in the next 10 minutes uh, are ideas of belonging, nation, um, and on this day, I think an appropriate topic of Britishness. Now, Britain by definition is international, not just for nations. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about empire, and I'm going to start with art. And the art that I'll start with is uh, by a Lahore-based artist, Rashid Rana. Uh, and you'll probably recognize the building it was uh, commissioned for, the Manchester Art Gallery. The art itself is, and you can hardly see it on that uh, right uh, part of the, uh, the, uh, the image, is a film. So it's, uh, it's printed, it's a photographic print on vinyl which is stuck on the glass that separates the two buildings of Manchester Art Gallery, the old and the new. Uh, you could miss it, but if you catch that sort of, that difference in color and come up close, you will see that that image of the buildings of Manchester Art Gallery are actually composed of thousands of small images um, from the streets of Lahore. It, the, the work evokes the Industrial Revolution, Lancashire's mills, which, are, which we all know were built really on breaking the back of India's textile industry, of the stories of South Asian labor that then flocked to Manchester uh, to work in these mills. So the Manchester Art Gallery's walls are built from the streets of Lahore. In the same exhibition, although not shown in Manchester, is a work by Hamra Abbas. It's called Making of English Portraits. Uh, and the portraits, these are people that she came across during a residency at the V&A Museum, are about this big. Um, but she also projects them. And as they oscillate back and forth, when they sort of match up, you can almost see through the faces into ornate patterns. They never become fully visible but you can glimpse precious objects from the v &A's collection, a jeweled turban ornament or a gold leaf hookah. The work speaks of cultural appropriation and actually the business of collecting cultures, which is the business of the museum. Now, at the same time as this Beyond the Page exhibition was happening in Manchester and London and eventually in the US, I was also working on a commission for the Royal Geographical Society. I was responding to their archives in a series of notes. I'm going to share a couple of images and a table from one of those notes, which was called Reclaiming Britain. Now, the, I was attracted to these two photographs because they, say, they have the same title, One Day's Bag. but tell very different narratives. Who caught what? And in a table, don't worry, you don't have to read all of it. Uh, there's a helpful red arrow at what you do need to read, <laughs> which is that even in 1812, so this is nearly half a century before the crown took over uh, running British India, nearly a third of the empire's GDP came from what was British India. And I'm talking about sort of uh, India, but really it's a stand-in for empire. And what all this shows is that there is, and I would argue, a claim on Britain. Economic, moral, cultural, the very fabric of the UK, we've seen the Manchester Art Gallery, has been built 
on the back of empire. So what I would argue and what I proposed is that we can be English and Scottish and Welsh or from Northern Ireland, but we cannot be British if we don't recognize our Indianness. There is a India-shaped hole in our conception of Britain. And for young people of South Asian origin, this has created an unrequited sense of belonging. This is an accusation. It is also a threat that, that realizes itself through securities, through lack of community cohesion. But I would argue that above all, it's, an, it's a possibility. It's an opportunity to let the world in. Now to do that, we, and to seize this opportunity, we have to look history in the eye. Now, not the sepia-tinted hues of Michael Gove and Neil Ferguson <clears throat> in what they've inserted into our history curriculums, but a more steely-eyed look, a more Germanic engagement with history. This was an intervention by uh, the artist Sophie Ernst. It's called Silent Empress. And this particular statue, and, and you can find them all over the world, this one happens to be in Wakefield. And Sophie attached a sound tag to the uh, with the blessing of Wakefield Council. The sound that it played was a monologue of quotes from journals and letters of Queen Victoria and extracts from speeches and texts by Brown, Blair, Cameron, Gladstone, Churchill. All of them gesturing towards an apology for a colonial past. This statue spoke for 30 minutes before the council decided it was disrespectful and needed to come down. Now, I would argue that we cannot turn away from discomfort. The cultural sphere in functioning democracies should be a profoundly <coughs> unsafe space for sacred cows. We need our statues to speak. They may tell us secrets that could come handy for the next few years. Because we've already talked about Article uh, 50. Uh, but let me remind everybody that this is not the first exit. Merely like those Facebook birthday reminders, Brexit will sit alongside, in 2017, 70 years of partition, 20 years of Hong Kong's handover, and what you see up here now is a work by Tom Malloy. It's called Borderline. Again, it's a small commercially available globe, which the artist has worked on and applied layer upon layer of white enamel paint, covering everything apart from the man-made lines that separate the borders of nations. So you know, what you see, and they appear now etched onto the globe, are the fractures that, defy, uh, that divide South Asia, West Asia, Africa, and Europe. They make us ponder the dissolution of empires in, uh, in Europe and the messy process of decolonization elsewhere, and violent upheavals that occur when people get separated by lines on maps. Lines of control is a project I started and it's a project about failure, about the failure of human beings to live together, the failure of nation states, and if nations are what Ben Anderson called imagined communities, then really we're talking about the failure of imagination. But partitions are also productive, <coughs> not in a, in a value judgment sense of the word, but in its literal sense. They produce nations, borders, they rewrite histories, they reconfigure memories. Lines of control started, again, in the Royal Geographical Society, uh, because that's where a lot of these lines were made, um, and in 2005. And its biggest iteration was at the Johnson Museum at the University of Cornell in 2012. Now, I'm not going to talk about all the works here, but suffice it to say that it expanded beyond just India's partition and had 34 uh, artists uh, participating at the birth of the newest of nations at that time, which was South Sudan. Uh, the red structure that you see here is uh, decolonizing architecture, the artist collective, making the red line of the Oslo uh, Accord real between Palestine and, and Israel. 
and Nadia Kabilinke's uh, work is an airbrush painting of a shadow that has no source. It recalls Auschwitz, surveillance, humanity reduced to Agamben's bare life, stripped of dignity and rights. Another commission by uh, the Rux Media Collective looks at three stands of poetry in Urdu, in Bengali, and that most quintessential of South Asian languages, English, on ideas of the stranger. So lines, borders are also ways of making friends become strangers. Sorry. And I think borders. The next speaker is <coughs> Vicky Price. Ex ex uh, mm. Let me just then conclude <laughs> to say that art is a form of knowledge that can do just that. It has the capacity to cross boundaries. And the first stirrings of efforts for that to become a flood, we need to really come up and live up to the potential for art to de-imperialize our minds and our institutions, to make our statues speak, to let the world in, to engage audiences as citizens, and to make strangers friends again. Thank you. Vicky Price is an economist who at various stages in her career, she has held a number of academic posts, including visiting professorships at Queen Mary University of London, Imperial College Business School and Cass Business School. She has also served on the Council of the Royal Economic Society as visiting fellow at Nuffield College, Oxford, on the Council of the University of Kent and the Court of the London School of Economics. Vicky is currently a fellow of the Society of Business Economists, an academ academician of the Academy of Social Sciences, on the Council of the Institute for Fiscal Studies on BIS Panel for Monitoring the Economy, and on the City AM Shadow Monetary Policy Committee, and on the advisory, two seconds, this is a long one, board of the Central Banking Think Tank O-M-F-I-F. Incredible. Is there no end to Vicky's talents? Vicky Price. Well, good morning. I know now what happens to speakers if they speak for longer than 10 minutes. So uh, I will be very, very uh, uh, careful what I say. Uh, and of course, uh, I can't have a prepared speech because it could have been considerably longer. Uh, but we are today meeting in a, uh, on a tremendous sort of um, day of significance for the UK, which is that uh, Theresa May has already, of course, signed the letter. Uh, she signed it yesterday. You've seen it in the front pages of, of all newspapers with different headlines. Uh, of course, the Daily Mail, as usual, says freedom. Uh, other newspapers are slightly more concerned about what the implications of that would be. But it is all happening today in terms of delivering this letter, and that begins the process of us. Uh, leaving. And it's interesting just uh, uh, hearing what uh, previous speakers have said, because uh, I'm told that within the civil service, uh, even though, of course, the majority of the civil servants, I used to be one myself, I, 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 uh, I worked for the Department for Business for ages, um, the, the whole project is uh, now uh, named Empire uh, Mark II, which is, uh, you know, how to really become open and re-engage with all these communities that perhaps we have lost a serious contact with. But, but that, of course, suggests a certain optimism in terms of what may be happening. And, and I'm afraid I'm on the side of the slight pessimists. And, and of course, I'm one of those experts that Michael Gove, as was referred to, didn't really want to listen to at all because there was, we were saying things that he didn't like. Uh, and also, apparently, we've been proven slightly wrong because the economy is doing reasonably well. But we must not underestimate the task ahead. Why did the economy do reasonably well uh, until now? Um, I think that's, that's going to be uh, looked at in great detail, I think, for future PhD students. Uh, but actually what has been happening is that uh, the Bank of England, uh, learning from what was going on uh, at the previous financial crisis, and I was actually working with a group that was dealing with these issues at the time, uh, found that the thing that worked best was flooding the economy with money when there is any crisis, so that the banking system continues to function. That's exactly what it did. Um, if you remember on, on, on June the 24th, those of you who set up all night, as we all did, uh, and were listening to the day program just to get a little bit of guidance, would have heard there was only one person in this political vacuum that resulted straight away, 
uh, which was a governor of the Bank of England, who came up and said, don't worry, I'm here to help and I'm going to do loads of things. Uh, the much maligned uh, um, governor of the Bank of England, who had been told off for sounding a bit pessimistic at the beginning because of the financial stability crisis that he thought may be happening if we were to vote to leave. And of course, the financial markets collapsed straight away. So he came and said, actually, um, I'm going to probably cut rates. Uh, there's going to be quantitative easing. In other words, I'm going to put lots of money into the economy by buying government bonds in the secondary market. For those of you who understand this um, terminology, and, and also I'll do lots of other things. I've been pu putting liquidity into the banks with weekly auctions. I've got about 250 billion, I think is what he said in the morning, to spend on this. I'm already spending a bit of it. And I'm going to do QE, which of course QE ended up being about 60 billion, uh, plus whatever he's buying on corporate bonds. Uh, and, uh, and of course, in addition, interest rates will be down, uh, probably come down to an even lower record level. And of course, the additional thing I'm going to be doing is take away the, the requirement by the banks to increase their liquidity next year, their the, the capital buffer, the anti-cyclical uh, the, the anti capital buffer. In other words, when things go well, uh, the banks need to capitalize a bit more and to get ready for a rainy day. 150 billion, I'll take that away. So anyone who was listening to this that morning, having been convinced to vote against you know, all sorts of promises of where the money was going to be going, because we're going to be saving, actually in the end it was agreed, just 8 billion net a year, would have added all these figures up uh, and seen that actually the cost of leaving is actually rather high to just keep the economy going. But of course that has given a lot of confidence to people who do not look down the sort of what does it actually cost us, to think everything will be absolutely fine and we can do everything we want, go to the Europeans, tell them we want to keep everything we've got right now, but we're just not going to be paying you anything for it. Uh, which of course, you know, you'd think perhaps isn't going to go down fantastically well, uh, and in fact isn't going down fantastically well. If you add to that the fact that savers have lost out because of course interest rates are so low, if you add to that that because of that we have to borrow an awful lot more money, all the money that is being given to businesses has of course to be accounted for because a lot of it comes from the public purse, uh, as, or through the Bank of England and the Treasury, so our, our borrowing is going up by about 100 billion. The Brexit effect itself is calculated to be about 60 billion by the independent and official um, uh, Office for Budget Responsibility. And then, of course, guild price, guild yields go down, which is the way that if interest rates come down, which is the way that, of course, uh, pensions uh, deficits are calculated. Huge increase in pension deficits. We're going to have to be paying for this for a very long period of time, in addition to what it might do to the economy overall, which of course may make things worse. So this optimism is actually quite, quite misplaced, but of course we as economists are just attacked for being wrong, having been wrong about it. And in some ways I, I wish in a way that Mark Honey had done what he did uh, and see what the impact is. But of course as a central banker, I've defended him continuously in, in everything I've ever done, uh, since is uh, you know, he had to do it because otherwise the, the financial system would be in trouble and we all need the cash that is required. Now what does it mean for us and our, uh, and our standing in the world, which of course is the thing that you're interested in particularly. Well, it has sort of made us a bit of a laughing stock, I have to say. Uh, the reaction from Europe was one of incredulity and it remains one. Uh, and of course the idea of going and telling the Europeans that we're only going to be paying you 3 billion and you think we're going to be paying you 50, for what we owe, uh, or we just walk away, uh, is obviously something that nobody can take fantastically seriously, and it's not quite the right negotiating stance. Uh, let alone what we're going to be doing with the people who are here, who we're using now as a sort of bargaining tool. And of course, we all know what the impact of migrants has been positive, basically. And it also improves the, the, the image of, of the UK. Instead, during the referendum campaign, we have become, uh, well, we look like xenophobic, uh, you know, hate crimes have gone up. Uh, a lot. Maybe it was all under the surface for a long period of time, kept down because of whatever else was thought to be considered to be appropriate to say. We seem to have unleashed all that and, and of course the image is not quite right. Investment, why should it come here when uh, we are going to be cutting the links with Europe or at least making them considerably more difficult. But anyone who tells you that it's all going to be fine at a time when it's going to cost us so much more and when in fact budgets for everything else, arts, everything else, are going to be under continuous review and therefore being cut down in order to make up for whatever else we need to be doing because of course the economy will be growing more slowly in the future. Uh, you know, obviously it has to be taken seriously that uh, the situation in the future is going to be tougher 
for, for all of us. And the years of austerity, therefore, will continue. The idea that we're going to have fantastic trade relations with any other countries, uh, you know, perhaps we will improve relationship with Australia, it accounts for 1% of our trade. 45% uh, goes to Europe, and a lot of it is nothing to do with tariffs uh, that are going to be a problem for us, although they will be significant if they're ever imposed. It is with non-tariff barriers. It is the regulatory environment. It is the fact that competition is assured. It is the fact that abuses of monopoly power can no longer take place. It is the fact that people can move easily, which allows not only the creative ju juices, if you like, to circulate, but also, of course, the expansion of firms that can now hire people without worrying, skills and so on, and which of course mean that uh, they can uh, innovate and continue to be productive at a time when of course there is low cost pressure coming from all sorts of countries like China and elsewhere. So the benefits have been tremendous, they have never been explained properly, and I have to admit that we, we the Remain sort of economists and others, have not been particularly good at explaining it, or if we did, it was never actually listened to. So the question is, where do we end up? How can we get out of this situation where cost to businesses, in fact, already are increasing because of the low exchange rate, uh, good for exports up to a point, but bad for manufacturing cost overall. We import an awful lot. Investment uh, has actually slowed down very significantly. Consumer spending, because of higher uh, import prices, is already having an impact in terms of where people are putting their money. Essentials, that's why they need to be uh, focusing on fuel, food, all going up. So all those are costs that have already incurred and there are the extra costs there. So where will we end up? But the truth is that instead of taking control, we are now supplicants. Here we are hoping that the Europeans are going to be nice to us, that they are going to let us have as good a deal as what May and, and, and David Davis have said, as good a deal as we had before. Um, all the benefits that we're having out of free trade and we're going to be doing absolutely fine. Well, I mean, the Europeans may decide that perhaps we are important. I, I'm Greek, as you can probably hear from my accent. I'm one of those people who came here to, 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 to study and stayed. And of course, I've been dealing with Grexit for a very long period of time, saying it shouldn't happen. Brexit and Grexit together are a bit of a nightmare for me, because I now have a, also a Greek identity card. I was hoping that, you know, at least Greece would be there. But now the two of them, of course, may well both leave, uh, and uh, that leaves me with uh, anyone who wants to adopt me, perhaps, <laughs> suggest uh, where I might go next. Uh, but so, so the Europeans might be nice to us, and they might indeed allow us to, to, to have something, uh, but of course we'll have to pay a price for this, uh, in terms of free movement of people and so on, uh, and actually that would be quite nice if they're kind to us. The chances are that they won't, uh, particularly if we go around saying that we're going to be leaving with no deal if necessary. So I am basically, to finish this off, before the next speaker is announced, um, <laughs> I am actually uh, uh, profoundly pessimistic about being able to achieve a deal in the time period we have, and actually quite pessimistic about the view of the world from the outside. Uh, I think now that we understand that nobody uh, actually will lose perhaps the right to be here until 2019, that's the latest thing that's coming out of, of, of number 10, uh, and is perhaps included in the letter which is going to be given today to, uh, to the Europeans. My house, which is already full of brain-drained people from Greece, would be even fuller, uh, because everyone will come here to try and have those, those benefits of being here, because there is something about this country. We love it. Uh, so far, we've had huge freedom, the ability to be anyone, dress whichever way you want, do whatever you like, and I rather like that, and everyone I know loves that. Losing that will be absolutely terrible for the UK and for the rest of the world. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Manira Mertzer. Uh, she's an advisor on arts and philanthropy. In 2009, she completed her PhD in sociology at the University of Kent and subsequently published The Politics of Culture, but she's perhaps best known for her role as Deputy Mayor for Education and Culture at the Greater London Authority between 2008 and 2016. She's worked for a range of cultural organisations, including the Royal Society of Arts, the independent think tank Policy Exchange and Tate. Manira is also a founding supporter of Change Britain, a cross-party campaign set up to make a success of Britain's exit from the U EU. Manira. Good morning, and uh, thank you to No Boundaries for inviting me to speak today. I'm really glad that the um, conference organisers included a session about this subject, 
First, because I believe it's very important that the art sector is part of the conversation about the future of Britain and its relationship to the world. And second, because I think the title of this session starts to frame things in a positive and even optimistic way. Because it won't have escaped anyone's notice that since the political events of the last year, the art sector has become pessimistic and anxious about the future. For many people in the arts, the vote to leave the EU looks simply like a mass rejection of the rest of the world, a pulling up of the drawbridge against Johnny Foreigner. And the fear of many arts organisations and professionals is that, whilst, that this will have both practical consequences on the way that they work with artists and partners from abroad, but more profoundly, they fear that Brexit will turn us into a nation of little Englanders and make it harder to support creativity and diverse ideas. What I want to argue today is that such a view is uh, simplistic and incorrect, both because of what it assumes about the majority of people who voted to leave in this country, and because it misses the fact that we now have a chance to forge a new, dynamic, and more inclusive relationship with the rest of the world. There will be many different reasons for why people voted the way they did in the referendum, but what we can see from recent polls is that the majority of Leave voters, like Remain voters, want free trade with the rest of the world. They also support the right of EU citizens in the UK to remain, and they want to develop a positive relationship with Europe. Leaving the EU is not the same thing as leaving Europe. And whilst undoubtedly there is a minority of xenophobes who want to end immigration completely, the majority of Leave voters are moderate and sensible. And it would be wrong to caricature them as racist and backwards, as so many people did in the aftermath of the vote, including, sadly, a number of prominent artists. Furthermore, around one million people from ethnic minority backgrounds voted to leave the EU, a third of the total ethnic minority voting population. Again, this doesn't chime with the stereotype of Leave voters being simply racist and wanting a whites-only country, or indeed wanting a return to past glories of empire. And Vicky uh, made the point about apparently the government has called their new strategy Empire Version 2 or Empire Mark 2. It's actually not true. No one in government uh, has said that they want to return to empire. That was a line that was put out by pro-Remain civil servants to pro-Remain journalists. And I don't think that what we're looking at is a, a revival of empire. As two of my very good friends from West Indian backgrounds who voted to leave told me, they felt that they were voting along class lines in solidarity with other people and not ethnic lines. And they resented the way in which middle class Remain voters caricatured them as bigots and racists. And for many voters from uh, the Commonwealth countries, from the former colonies who have moved to Britain, they feel that Britain's membership of the EU often came at the expense of relations with the former uh, countries of their origin. In fact, there were and there are many people who support Brexit on the grounds that it is paradoxically the EU that stops us from being truly international in our approach. The EU is protectionist, it's a protectionist bloc. It privileges internal migration at the expense of non-EU migration. And you can see the way in which the EU has forced countries like Spain to close its borders to countries like Morocco, where they've traditionally had a huge amounts of migration. And it makes it impossible for member states to organise trade deals with other countries around the, around the world. The way in which the EU's tariffs and common agricultural policy harms Africa and its prospects for prosperity, and it's come under criticism for a very long time. So far from being about taking down borders, the EU was very busy building them up. Now, I realise that these words may upset a lot of people, and emotions run high on both sides. My point today is not to attack the EU and its problems, but to point out that there is no reason now to think we have to go backwards. The way that I think Britain and the art sector in Britain can thrive with a new approach to international engagement. So what do I think the art should be talking about? First, the government's priority will be to develop a new relationship with the EU and its member states. No one should pretend that forging this relationship will be easy, but it's certainly achievable. The priorities will be to try and match as closely as possible the current access we have to the single market without having to be a member. And for many in the arts who work regularly with Europe, this is about lobbying to secure ease of travel and movement of goods. It's about maintaining regulations that support the sector. And it's about asking government to assist with any additional burden of administration. 
We also need to decide which EU programmes we want to remain part of. For instance, the Erasmus scheme, for, for which students can uh, study and work abroad, is open to many non-EU countries, and we'd almost certainly want to remain involved. There will be many other cultural networks, again, which often include non-EU countries, which we will want to remain part of. The EU has provided funding to arts organisations in the UK, although I think that this has often been exaggerated. £10 million in one year from the Creative Europe Fund compares to £600 million from Arts Council England every year and over £1 billion from the national government uh, to the cultural sector in the UK. It is a small part of overall funding, but we would want to see it replaced uh, uh, by the UK uh, and restored uh, to uh, as high a level as possible. And second, beyond Europe, of course, there are also opportunities. Once we leave the EU's customs union, we'll be free to initiate our own trade deals with other countries, something the EU is famously ineffective at. We want to develop stronger relationships with India and China, where there's a huge interest in British cultural exports. The UK exports more cultural goods and services to the USA than any other country, yet we have no deal with them. We could include culture in future trade negotiations, something the EU always excluded because other member states had smaller creative sectors and were worried about trying to protect them. With regards to immigration, we'll have control over the entire system, which means we no longer need to discriminate between EU and non-EU citizens, but treat people equally and fairly. And whilst free movement may end, and with it the right, automatic right to citizenship, we should lobby for a more effective system of fluidity of movement, work permits, skills-based criteria, and employer sponsorship. I worked for London government for eight years, and I believe passionately that immigration has been good for this country. It brings huge diversity. The diversity of a city attracts talent. It attracts uh, people who want to come and bring ideas. And it's one of the ingredients of success. But our immigration system needs to be modernised and made more equitable for non-Europeans and reflect our current welfare system. Finally, I think we should see that Britain has a huge amount of soft power through its cultural services and its creative industries. This isn't about showing off to the rest of the world, but it is about sharing culture and building relations built on trust and mutual benefit. I believe that the British Council has a hugely important role to play, as does the Arts Council, in forging collaborations. And there's one uh, particular programme that I always mention in relation to this, the British Museum's International Training Programme for Curators, which supports dozens of curators from countries all around the world uh, in uh, developing their curating practice. And it's precisely this kind of cultural exchange, including Europe, but also looking beyond to the wider world. Because ultimately, whilst our identity is bound up with Europe, it's also bound up with other countries outside Europe through a shared past and a shared future. One of my favourite artists, Rashid Areen, uh, moved to London from Pakistan in the 1950s uh, to start making minimalist sculpture in this country. And at the time, he received very little recognition from the cultural elite in Britain. He wasn't recognised as part of the mainstream modernist movement. And he began to write about this Eurocentric logic, which he believed blinded so many art historians to black and minority ethnic artists from the former colonies. They could only see these artists as different, foreign, with a separate identity and culture. I believe that things have changed in the art sector. Our art sector today is more diverse. It's a much more inclusive understanding of art history, or at least it recognises it needs to develop that. Our museums and galleries, our theatres and orchestras are working increasingly outside of Europe and developing collaborations. Irene himself was shown at the Sharjah Biennial in 2014, an event which has helped to cement the importance of Arab influence in contemporary art. The world is changing, and our relationship with the world needs to change too. The, the post-war imperative to connect with Europe was, of course, important, but it no longer makes sense at a time when we have artists from around the world coming to Britain to only think in terms of our connection with Europe. So when we are told by political campaigners, by artists who support Remain, uh, uh, that we are European with such pride, let's consider what message that sends to the non-European world, to non-EU artists who come to the UK, to people from Commonwealth countries who now live in the UK, and how bizarre it must seem to them for us to prioritise and privilege one continent over the rest of the world. Let's recognise that there, there are other ways that we can engage with the world, and that, in fact, it's the internationalism of the arts that reminds us why it's important to be open rather than closed. Thank you.
Now let me introduce you to Honor Rhodes. She studied ancient and medieval history before training and practicing as a social worker. She now works at Tavistock Relationships, exploring her fascination with human relationships, both troubled and healthy. Honor is, funding, is a funding trustee of the Early Intervention Foundation and is a special advisor to the School and Family Trust. Honor Rhodes. I'm going to take you on a different journey to a different country, which is the one inside us. Um, I'm going to be thinking about being trusting in an age of anxiety, and that seems particularly appropriate today. And I have just discovered that trust, when you sign, is this. I give that to you for free. <laughs> You'll be able to see whenever I say trust, even if you don't want to listen to me. It's always hard to... <laughs> It's always hard to know where to start with a subject as large and as emotionally charged as trust. So let's start at the beginning then. The tiny newborn infant, scarcely able to control her limbs or focus her eyes. Yet she is driven with an urgent need to survive. And for that she needs the bottom rung of Maslow's hierarchy of needs to be reliably and consistently met. She must be fed, kept warm and kept safe. This is the minimum we all need to survive. Yet we strive to exist, so we need not only to be kept physically safe, but to be contained and secure emotionally. The infant isn't born with a trusting state of mind. This is something we all have to learn. We trust as it allows us to sustain ourselves when our needs are not met instantly or those who care for us, for us are absent from us. Trust allows us to believe as a conjecture about the future, that we will be attended to and comforted and restored, just not quite now. So trust and hope are two companions. In ideal circumstances, the infant grows, developing a strong sense of herself. Her parent or parents, carers, will be what Donald Winnicott called good enough. They'll be good enough for what they do. Good enough sounds like quite a low bar. What happened to perfect? <coughs> Donald Winnicott counselled strongly against the idea of perfection. A good enough mother allows herself to be used by the infant so that he or she may develop a healthy sense of omnipotence which will naturally be frustrated as the child matures, and this is all to the good. So what Donald Winnicott is suggesting helpfully is that it is our duty as parents to slowly and surely disappoint our children. <laughs> this gave me great comfort, I tell you now. <laughs> and I give it again to you to hold on to in the very dark days. We must do so knowingly. We must say no. We must contend with the idea that we are not our child's friend. They will have enough of those. We are something unique and utterly special. We are a parent with authority to be used wisely. If we don't help our children manage disappointment, then the adult we world will be a constantly shocking place until that child, as an adult, learns to self-manage. And this is a much harder task in adulthood and a state of mind not conducive to warm, lasting friendships and intimate relationships. This focus on the small child may seem remote from our adult relationships, but it is the pattern for them. Most of us have had good enough parenting most of the time and grow up with a proportionate sense of entitlement. If we've had insufficient care and insufficient unequivocal love, we may carry a burden of unworthiness into our careers and our maturity. If, on the other hand, all our needs have been met before we can fully experience and manage the frustration of being denied, then we can become overweening in our sense that the world should bend to our will. Some children have been bitterly disappointed in childhood and carry those emotional scars with them into the world and their work. 
We all know deeply pessimistic and troubled people. Some are temperamentally so. Others are located in this place because of earlier experiences. But temperament, gender and birth order do matter, as a loss for one child in a family can be devastating, but for their brothers and sisters less so. Perhaps they had another relationship that offered them protection, a teacher, an extended member of their family, or just friendships by and large. So the pattern of our early life colours our expectations. It will form our responses and our relationships. It will predict our capacity to tolerate new ideas, challenging situations, conflict and unreasonable demands from others. It may well orient us to our careers. Many firstborns with high trust values are found in the helping and creative professions. Is that you? What happens, though, when our trusting child meets their first observable lie or some other situation that can only be experienced as an attack on their trust? Think back to a time in your own childhood when you felt a small stab of betrayal. The friend who promised to sit next to you and then with a smile slips into a seat next to another child. For children, these acts of betrayal are scolding. They're often at the heart of the cry, it's not fair. It's not fair to have something you trusted in denied to you. And no adult response can ever really mend that hurt. Even if the adult arbiter agrees with us, they can't make the desirable thing happen. It wasn't the toy we really wanted. It was to have the toy and to play with our sister. Often in life we learn we can have one, but not both. Small acts of betrayal we can learn to manage. And in truth, we embark on a life of carrying them out on others all the while knowing how much they hurt. Larger acts of betrayal trust are far more complicated. Sometimes in our intimate relationships, it's not our partner's actual infidelity that so attacks us and smashes through our view of ourselves and the world, but the smaller breaches of trust along the way. Missing a birthday party with a lie, misusing family money, lying to the children about why you were away from home. These things are stored up in the list of acts of betrayal. They will be examined and weighed and examined again. Painfully, we can restore ourselves and our relationship if we have a mind to. The relationship therapist, though, is very like the parent who cannot give us both the things we desire. Many people whose partners have betrayed their trust want both the deepest, most sincere and most humiliating of apologies and for things to be the way they were. It's disconcerting in relationship therapy, though, to find that the therapist will refuse to take my side against my philandering partner. She refuses to punish him. She listens intently to what he has to say, even though it is an attack on me. It's not fair. And for the couple, they have to learn that it is the relationship between them that's the patient. Uh, there's no Wimbledon umpiring with minutes for each of us to talk. Until the couple can understand that the rope of the relationship that has bound them together is what is important, and how each of them must hold their end firm, then repairing the frame middle or unravelling the giant knot is not possible. For those of you interested in thinking more about this, then you will need to come and train as a Tavistock Relationships Counsellor. For the very few of you for whom this doesn't appeal, I'm going to post a Twitter link to the trust measure devised by John Gottman so that you can all measure how trusting you are. And so it is in the organisations we work in and connect with. Organisations are only made up of people after all. And all these people have been tiny infants once, managing or not managing disappointments, fear of abandonment and rage. We are each of us offering ends of ropes to others, tangling and unwinding, pulling or leaving slack, trusting and liking, disliking and betraying as we go. We remain in our heart of hearts, rather small and rather needy children, and so we must be careful and kind in how we go about our business. Uh, John McGrath, who is the Artistic Director of Manchester International Festival, and I'm very much looking forward to his first festival this summer here in Manchester. 
Appointed to the role in 2015, John was previously Artistic Director of National Theatre Wales, which he launched in 2009, achieving an international reputation for large-scale site-specific work, digital innovation, international collaboration and extraordinary community involvement. John. The uh, invitation to talk to this event was uh, quite a challenging one. The invitation was, could you talk about internationalism and a sense of place, but please could you not bang on too much about Manchester International Festival? <laughs> Which seemed a bit harsh, really, given that I've spent the last 18 months running around the world talking to international artists about coming to this place, Manchester, and then engaging with the festival. But it was a great challenge. And as I thought about trying to frame this talk, one artist kept coming to mind, and I couldn't really work out why. An artist that I didn't know well and I'd only met briefly once. It was an artist called Liam Buckskin, who is an indigenous Australian artist and activist who I'd heard talk about a project that she did with young people in South Australia. It was a project with young people who were either a danger or engaged in petrol sniffing, which at that time had been an, academic, uh, uh, an epidemic among young indigenous Australian people, struggling with a uh, loss of identity in the world in which they found themselves. And Leanne was engaged in a project, one that might in many ways feel fairly familiar to a lot of people in this room, going out to those communities of young people to engage through music, through spoken words, through rap, in helping them to find other ways to find an identity, to find a way of expressing the things that were troubling with them. One of the things that really amazed me about what Leanne did is that she would drive for days with her teams to reach these young people who were often living in the outbacks of Australia in places that were entirely inaccessible to a lot of the cultural offerings that um, dot the coastal cities. Many, many days travelling, often for a short workshop, but a sense that what she could offer and what her companions could offer was so important that that journey needed to be made. And that image of Leanne doing that work kept coming to me as I thought about the speech. And I wondered why, why, why is that particular example coming to my mind? And I realised in this moment in which we're living um, that Leanne was emblematising in a way two things. First of all, that population that she's part of and that she's working with have been struggling for hundreds of years now with the movement whose consequences continue to play out for us and play out so predominantly in the politics of today. The greatest migration maybe that has ever happened, the movement of European peoples across continents and across the world with sometimes extraordinary and sometimes truly devastating results. Among those devastating results have been what happened to the communities, to the indigenous communities of Australia. But the other thing that impressed me and amazed me about Leanne's work was that she managed to approach what she did, as many other indigenous Australian artists that I've met now over the years have approached what they did, with a true open heart to a combination of embracing belonging, embracing tradition, but also engaging with change. The art that she was bringing to her young people was negotiated, was talked through with the elders that surrounded those young people and referenced the many hundred years of traditions of her communities. But it was also new. It was also international. It involved rap. It involved music from the Americas, from Europe. It wasn't closed. It was open. A difficult negotiation, but one that she continues to make and that artists like her continue to make and that we, in our moments of crisis, can perhaps learn from. And so to break perhaps for a moment the rule that I was given and talk a little bit about artists at Manchester International Festival, <laughs> three artists that I'm particularly excited about, of course, I'm excited about all of them equally, but three for today um, that I wanted to mention are each in a way engaging with that um, balance of belonging and change. Susan Afuna, an artist who is 
part Egyptian and part German, and in some ways then lives on that boundary um, between the migrations of people from the Middle East and North Africa to Europe, um, is working in Manchester with people who are new arrivals in the city to look at their movements. What is it to move? What is it to be a sentient being in a city that's strange to you? And relate that to the beautiful patterned artwork that she makes. Samson Young, an amazing artist from Hong Kong. We've mentioned already that Hong Kong has its 20 years anniversary of, um, of handover this year, uh, is himself making the journey from Hong Kong by train to Europe in order to explore the myth that is still embedded in many Chinese communities here of early travelers to Europe who came entirely by foot. He can't quite manage coming by foot, but he's going to do it by train. And Shamina Bajchinoy, the great Oscar-winning film director, who is looking at that extraordinary migration of 70 years ago in India, Pakistan, trying to make a film um, based on the memories of people now in their 70s about homes that they left during partition. And again, herself struggling with the fact that for her and for her film crews, part of the legacy of that partition and that moment is that it's very hard for her to cross the border into India to make those films. But not only artists who come from those places that are affected by that great European migration are making work and taking those risks in the festival. And I think it's equally important that we look at artists based in from and working out of European traditions and how they also embrace the risk of the moment we're in and this need to combine a sense of belonging with an understanding of change. So Thomas Ostermeyer, the great German theatre director, abandoned his project for us in the autumn of last year, less, less than nine months before the festival starts. A beautiful piece that he'd been working on based on French surrealism and said, I can't do this work anymore. The moment we live in is too urgent. I'm going to come up with a new project. I don't know what it is. He has come up with a new project. They're inventing and creating it now. I'm sure it will be extraordinary, but what a risk even for someone with his reputation to take. Likewise, Yel Batana, based in Berlin, creating a piece called What If Women Rule the World, in which she doesn't know what the outcome of the work will be each night, because she'll invite a different group of women onto stage, experts in their fields, um, to talk about and discuss where the world is going and how it might be changed. For me, the frame of all of that work is, in a way, for a moment, fairly straightforward to establish. It's in a festival, a festival of new commissions, of new work, and we can look at it through these prisms like an embrace of change and belonging, but I don't necessarily have to state those prisms because the artists, in taking these risks, are doing that for me. I also frame in a festival that says, around all of this complexity, there must be moments of pure joy, moments of extraordinary music, moments that take us out as well as bring us in to the questions of our time. And yet, I think we do all also, all of us here, have a responsibility around framing. How do we look at this work that these artists are producing? How do we ask artists to make work that engages with these difficult, contentious questions? And a few frames have been talked about, particularly over the last year. The frame, for example, of empathy, really one of my favorite words, um, a word that in theater is all about what you do as an actor, step inside someone whose worldview you may not understand. Frames have also been suggested around listening, particularly for the metropolitan areas, to listen to other areas of the UK and hear the voices that maybe haven't been heard. And yet, is that listening too one-sided? What's the silence that's implied in listening? And with empathy, what are the boundaries of that empathy? Those of you who maybe get a chance to see uh, John O'Convera's extraordinary piece, Vertigo C, which is on at the Whitworth Art Gallery at the moment, that piece asks a question of empathy. Where does empathy stop? Why sometimes does it stop before we embrace the whole of humanity? And yet, why would it also stop at the edges of humanity when there are other inhabitants of this planet? The questions are difficult and complex, even when we have seemingly pleasant frames like empathy. And so I'd put forward today a slightly different frame, maybe one that's less comfortable. 
And I go for an example once again to our artist from Australia, uh, another indigenous artist, Jacob Bohem, who I had the pleasure to work with several times over the last couple of years. Jacob told me the story of his cousin, who is an Australian football player called Adam Good, one of the great Australian football players, who's also been very vocal about racism in the sport. And he ignited a controversy when he celebrated um, during a, a match by making a sign of himself throwing an imaginary spear. And that spear was for him an expression of his background, of his placing as an indigenous man in Australia. But for a fairly um, sometimes um, a group of, of um, spectators who he had sometimes characterized as, as at least in part being racist, um, that um, waving of the spear was an act of aggression for which he was roundly criticized in the Australian media. Jacob introduced um, Adam's story as a way to talk about debate and a way to think about debate in Australia for young indigenous people. The debate can't be a place where anger, where even a sense of threat or violence can just be closed down and where we can be told, you can't do that, you can't wave your, your spear in the air. So he created a debate program called Imaginary Spears in which young people were encouraged and artists were encouraged to say the unsayable, to be angry. These are the kind of spaces that I think we need now, not ones that are polite, not ones that are just about listening or even empathy, but a raucous where the spit, the tears, the snot come out and are allowed to be expressed and, allow, and where we allow ourselves to disagree, to listen, yes, but also to shout. So let's take a lesson from some of those um, artists across the world, far across the world, who struggled for centuries with some of the things that we struggle with now. Let allow ourselves to embrace a sense of belonging, but also always change. And let us always allow everybody in the arts and in our communities to be raucous. Thank you.